2022 lightning talk on offshore hosting. Um, basically, we'll be talking about legitimate use of ASNs um, or a subterfuge, right? And um, the person who will be giving the, the talk today is um, Lee Kent, um, who is um, affiliated with um, AA, PA, and BN Media Group. And um, I will probably be, or rather, I'm your um, your on-site moderator today. Uh, my name is Caleb Ogundele, and so we want to welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming in. Uh, but first, I would like to confirm if Lee is online right now, and he can. Um, I am. Yes, thank you, Caleb. Okay, great. So I will just give you um, the heads up. I'm sorry, I will just give you the floor to um, go ahead and introduce your lightning talk. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, as Kevin mentioned, my name is Lee Kent. I'm, I'm one of the content protection managers at B in Media Group, um, who are a uh, sports and entertainment broadcast um, across 32 different territories um, and in three different uh, languages. Um, so the internet is very much at our heart um, and all its good uses, but unfortunately, um, we, as we all know, uh, there are some bad actors, um, not only the end users, um, but those uh, intermediaries as well. And part of that is what I'm going to talk to you today. Um, BN are also members of the Audiovisual Anti-Piracy Alliance, um, and as a way of introduction uh, to uh, AAPA, um, these are our members um, of the Alliance. We all work very closely together um, on issues um, concerning content rights, content ownership, um, and the distribution of those, um, of those uh, rights and content. As you can see, most of the major sports broad, uh, content owners um, and uh, broadcasters as well. Um, APA's approach and mission statement um, is to lead efforts in tackling piracy um, across Europe and the Middle East um, and beyond um, through the facility of collaboration um, amongst its members and others, um, working closely with um, a wider group of audiences um, to understand key issues um, and develop solutions um, to tackle those. Um, APA also lobbies um, for better piracy legislation and enforcement um, and to build um, partnerships with private and pu public uh, sectors um, to achieve more efficient um, enforcement. So the lightning talk today um, um, is about um, part of that uh, landscape um, and those intermediaries um, who facilitate um, in the uh, distribution of piracy. Um, and as, we know, as, as you may or may not know, um, certainly the hosting provider landscape um, continues to evolve um, and has recently become proliferated with companies using the term uh, offshore hosting. Um, for us, curious uh, term, um, given the fact that um, nothing can be truly offshore. Um, and, and the aim of this talk really is to engage uh, with everyone there. Um, to understand what does it actually mean um, and, and how can we uh, get um, a better understanding of, of how ASNs are used. Um, is our view correct um, or have we missed something? So there are, it is a, I would like some interaction um, from everybody in the room um, to certainly have some questions and um, some understanding of, um, of our position. Um, the ultimate aim is to um, seek to understand whether or not structure of offshore hosting is legitimate um, or a deliberate or deliberately established to facilitate criminality. The structure of an offshore host, um, they don't appear to own any physical hardware, uh, generally fake or questionable uh, headquarters in countries where there is poor intellectual property legislation, lease the IPs uh, from outside the ASN registered territory. Um, however, they heavily depend on interconnections um, and renting servers uh, within major um, hubs, UK, EU um, and the US uh, to name a few. 
Um, they um, have predominantly had ripe ASNs, um, which um, we don't know whether or not that is a deliberate act um, or whether or not um, it's just the opportunity or the process that they have gone through in order to get an ASN. Um, but the benefits um, that are advertised by these offshore hosts um, is that they uh, have that uh, accredited ASN. Um, and one particular one is the example I'm using here. Um, their headquarters address is in Hong Kong. They use IPs from the Seychelles um, and they rent server space in the Netherlands, which then gives them the ability to be able to advertise they have hardware and claim to be based uh, in the European Union um, and particularly the Netherlands. Um, further examples of, of what the benefits are um, or the advertising um, bragging rights for these uh, offshore hosts um, is that they will keep your content, um, your website, um, or whatever it is that you have hosted with them online, uh, no matter what. They also advertise the fact that they will ignore um, or at least encourage the fact that they will not deal with DMCA notices. Um, and I'll come on to what DMCA notices are um, in a moment. Um, one of them, uh, one particular hosting company um, has even gone as far um, as offering services to support the illicit distribution um, of um, IP uh, TV systems um, and providing their, uh, their end users um, easy access to a, a TV platform that um, distributes um, infringing content of um, all major broadcasters at a global uh, level. And as you can see, it's not particularly expensive uh, to be able to do this. Um, 200 IP TV streams could easily be uh, 1,000, 2,000 end users um, accessing that service, um, having a considerable um, impact on the broadcasters and their distribution rights. Offshore hosting providers, um, is a, as a typical uh, demonstrated here, the way that they're organized um, is that they will um, be assigned an ASN through a local internet registrar. Um, and obviously that is, uh, um, it's, it's gained uh, from, uh, I see somebody's posted a question. Um, Internet is oh, good for sure. Structure solves um, many problems, such as the way of all authoritarian flaws like this. Once you portray it, sure, once you just criminals, we only to protect your narrow interests. Um, that I would not at all. Uh, we're not. We're not saying that all uh, offshore hosting um, is for um, is for bad. What and as I mentioned in, in my opening uh, comment, um, the question is um, an open question. And it is an open question to you guys um, that uh, is there some legitimate uh, use for offshore hosting? Certainly the ones that I'm, I'm now describing and the examples I'm giving, um, the view is, um, is that they are uh, being used um, primarily um, for criminal interests um, when actually they could be used um, in, a, in a better way. Um, so it is about an understanding, and this is a two-way uh, conversation. Um, and I'd be very keen to kind of pick that um, pick that up with you. Um, but Hello. coming back to yes, Caleb. Yes, um, sorry about um, the interruption, uh, but um, some of the audience in the room would want you to perhaps read out the questions uh, that are being asked online uh, so that they can see, uh, sorry, they can get to know the questions and they can um, follow along. Yes, yes, so I'll, 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 I'll repeat the question. So the question was, internet is for global good. Offshore infrastructure solves many good problems, such as a way out of authoritarian controls and excesses.
where Alliance wants to portray all offshore infrastructure, um, and reiterating the point, this is an open question um, on whether or not um, what we see um, is unique um, and in a way unique to facilitate um, criminality. Um, and these examples that uh, I'm now working through um, and in the examples I'm giving, um, is that the normal? Is that the standard for all offshore hosting companies to be set up? Um, so it's a question. Um, and if you have any answers or any comments uh, to that particular question, then feel free to post them for those in the room. Um, please put them to Caleb um, because it is, it, I want this to be an open discussion. Um, that's the whole purpose of this particular session. Um, so um, the users put another one. Um, the answer is yes. It could be potential a hundred times or a thousand times as good as the tiny portion of your eternal copyright revenues that might be hurt. That too hurt only a viewed with a short sight. Um, Caleb, and I, I to this um, user who's posting the questions, I feel that this is becoming a bit of a distraction, I'm afraid. Um, I, I appreciate um, your, 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 your point of view. Um, however, the revenues of copyright are uh, quite substantial uh, and copyright is the um, entertainment um, and creative arts globally. Um, so we're not just talking about TV content. Uh, there are many forms of creative content that are distributed um, across the internet, um, and this impacts um, all. Um, and the uh, user in the chat, um, I do feel that you're um, unfortunately not addressing the, uh, the the question that I'm asking. So I am going to move on. Um, and so Kent, sorry to interrupt. Um, so what? What I would suggest is um, for all the questions in the chat, um, you can answer them immediately after your presentation. I agree. Yep, I agree. Um, okay, so um, moving on. Um, as I mentioned, um, ASN numbers uh, for these offshore hosting companies um, are assigned through a local internet registrar um, who ultimately gets it from the regional uh, internet registrar. Um, what we have seen um, is that the host one um, is the owner of the ASN. However, the ASN is used across multiple um, brand names, multiple uh, companies who on uh, research, um, ultimately uh, downstream and peer with one another, um, but eventually ending up back with host one. And it's host one that maintains the upstreaming interconnectors um, with um, the onshore um, elements. So those hardware-based servers in Europe, uh, US and the UK. Um, so how do um, content owners, broadcasters um, and other members of uh, APA uh, address the issue of infringement? Um, the first step is always to send a DMC, DMCA notice. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a DMCA notice is a Digital Millennium Copyright Act notice, um, which is a, a piece of US legislation which has been accepted um, globally um, because it sets out some particular standards that the uh, content owner um, must meet um, for any um, host or ISP to accept um, that particular claim. Um, firstly, you must demonstrate that you have right to make the claim. You have to provide evidence um, of the infringement. Um, and then you have to um, uh, address the where the uh, infringement is a uh, piece of content to be removed. Um, for the most, um, it works. Um, and ISPs and hosts, um, once they have done their review um, and their checks, um, content is removed. However, for uh, a large proportion of the offshore hosting companies that we interact with, um, this isn't the case. So our next step would be to have an outreach program uh, with the host company, um, sending physical letters, 
and email addresses uh, or emails, sorry, to any uh, emails that we can uh, find associated with that company. Um, if they continue to go um, unresponsed, unresponded to, um, then we will look at legal action. Um, however, that in itself um, can be a challenge. Um, as mentioned, generally DMC notices go answered. Websites, for the most, don't have any contact pages. Company addresses are fake or have PO boxes, um, and therefore making, as I mentioned earlier, legal recourse um, is difficult or impossible, uh, either due to the local legislation or because the owners of the hosting company uh, cannot be traced. So why is this an issue to the audiovisual industry um, and, and beyond? Um, this is an example of one particular offshore hosting company um, and reviewing uh, data for the last six months um, of, um, of the football season. 90% uh, of our requests to take down content um, were, were, were ignored, um, allowing infringement to continue. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is not the uh, expected uh, behavior of a uh, company um, or an organization um, or the, a, an organization that, um, that has a responsibility um, to maintain uh, corporate governance um, or a good corporate, corporate structure. Um, in addition to the issues that we have with copyright and content infringement, um, there have been several studies, and I'm just highlighting a, a very uh, small uh, one here. Um, the impact um, on end users um, when it comes to not just viewing copyrighted uh, content, um, but also their exposure uh, to other cyber risks, um, such as viruses and malware. Um, and a study um, in 2019 and 2020 um, demonstrated the increase um, of this risk um, from 40 to 49%. Um, and we are waiting for other studies um, to, uh, to be published um, to look at what the landscapes now. Um, APA have done a, a recent um, study, um, which was more focused on applications that provided access to pirate content and the results were very similar. Um, so it's not just about the content itself and the end users having access to it. Um, there is a wider uh, impact on the end users um, who believe that they are um, accessing um, infringing content or even um, have no knowledge of accessing infringing, infringing content, but expose themselves um, to, uh, to other cyber risks. So going right back to the beginning, um, this is a call to action. Um, we do need help. Um, we need better understanding. Um, we need to gain some feedback um, whether or not um, this is the normal uh, ecosystem of an offshore host. Um, and if all reasonable steps have been taken to address the issue directly with the hosting company um, and its subsidiaries, and its subsidiaries um, what does a content owner do within the ecosystem? Who has the responsibility? And how can anybody escalate any issues um, if the hosting company remains unresponsive? So APA seeks um, to understand uh, the IGF view on the practices of offshore hosting. Are they abusing the allocation of the ASN? Um, or is it, as I've mentioned several times, um, the recognized and um, good practice of an ASN to be set up in the ways that I have uh, previously de described. Um, do the RAWs um, or other intermediaries such as the local internet registrars um, have the tools to take any action? If a host um, can be uh, identified um, as abusive and unresponsive. Um, and ultimately, how can the audiovisual industry and APA uh, work with uh, RAS and AIGF stakeholders to tackle offshore hosting providers um, who potentially abuse the system. So that is the end of my presentation. Does anybody um, have any further questions?
Thank you very much, Lee, for the wonderful presentation. And um, I can see that the audience are trying to engage with you like we have in the room here. So you have your first question from someone who looks like a friend called Sebastian. But this is um, Bram. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it was interesting. Um, your last slide, I think, asked about taking all reasonable steps. So I want to kind of start there. The two things I guess I was thinking about that I, it would be helpful to hear more about maybe. One is, um, I guess, in no particular order, but one is, look, if these hosts are, are, are have touch points with the Netherlands and the UK, which have you know, very mature legal systems, why wouldn't you go to court and say, look, I need an order against the well-identified hosting provider who's selling to these guys, right? Um, you know, get a John Doe order, figure out who it is that's their customer and go after those people. Because normally, you know, I, I, I would think you'd want a court order rather than a DMCA order, which has no legal probity in those jurisdictions, right? And then the other question, and just to put them both on the table and then address them the order you want, I mean, it's just, you didn't talk really about the financial flows. And, you know, obviously the first thing I would have thought of is like, these guys are receiving money somehow. Um, you know, I bet they're even receiving money in sort of convenient to use payment schemes rather than, uh, you know, Zcash or whatever it is. And so why not go after the, the financial flows? Like that would be the other uh, obvious thing I'd want to, you know, in, in understanding how no stone was unturned, those would be the two steps is John Doe orders against the, the West European hosting providers and then the financial flows. Thank you. In terms of um, doing John Doe uh, subpoenas, that itself um, brings additional problems. Um, unfortunately, uh, there has been some attempts to do that. The one in particular is a, a case with uh, b and Sports and Scaleway. Um, and Scaleway were unable uh, to provide uh, any details of the uh, user sitting on their infrastructure because they didn't keep any records. Um, and, and b and lost that case. Um, it was found that that was, uh, that was reasonable. Um, there are um, other considerations that um, are currently going through and whether or not we can use that in other juris jurisdictions. And APA are working with other copyright organisations to look at uh, the legalities um, and whether or not we can proceed with that. Um, in terms of follow the money, one of the, uh, unfortunately, as a private entity, um, we have limited uh, resources to, uh, to, to follow money. Um, we do have the ability to uh, make information requests. Um, and again, that is a process that we're currently going through. But again, it, it's, it's challenging um, because, as you said, we have to find the way that the money is received in the first place. Um, and they do, uh, certainly the organisations that we've interacted with, um, do use um, payment facilities that make it challenging uh, to investigate and challenging to, uh, to track. So the, all the elements you have mentioned, um, we are using them um, and we are going through those processes. Um, and this is basically something that's um, in parallel uh, to those uh, processes and actions. And, and, and for us, as I mentioned right at the beginning, it is really about getting that understanding um, you know the the the, the person who um, who put the questions forward um, on online. Um, we do want to have a um, an overall view, and we do appreciate that. You know, in a, in, a, in a way, we are looking at this purely from uh, from our point, um, what we see, um, and how it facilitates copyright infringement. Um, we've got no reason to look at it, to be honest, um, from any other way. So it's an an, an open view um, to challenge the, the the status quo ultimately. Um, and if somebody wants to tell us and demonstrate that yes, this is perfectly acceptable and this is perfectly normal for ASNs to be used like this, um, then you know change our minds. But at the moment, um, we only see it in one way. So we have one more question. Hi, Lee. Um, my name is Leslie Nobile, and I work for Aaron. And of course, I work closely with RIPE NCC. Um, so the thing about policies to issue uh, autonomous system numbers, they're very easy to obtain from an RIR. At Aaron, you either have to have a unique routing policy that you show us, 
or you have to tell us that you're going to be multi-homed with another autonomous system or that you're going to interconnect with another autonomous system. And there's not a lot of vetting done for that. You give us you know, wh who your other autonomous system is going to be and we just kind of look at it and we do some vetting, but it's very simple and it is for in the ripe region as well. So the thing is, okay, so anyone can get one basically as long as you're multi-homed, right? But if there's illegal activity, there be if a number resource or autonomous system number is being used for any legal activity, our registration services agreement says we can go back and, and pursue that with law enforcement. So if something like that is reported to an RIR, and I believe that RIPE would do something very similar, if you report that and can show us something that, you know, really, really hardcore, like something that can, you know, sort of prove that this is happening, something we can take to law enforcement because, you know, law enforcement needs really concrete evidence before they'll even look at it. I mean, in the US, the FBI has to look, see that there's some type of financial damage. I mean, if you can show us things like that or can provide some evidence to us, first of all, we would research it more fully, um, but we could turn it over to law enforcement or we could at least assist. Um, we have on, you know, general counsels that can look at these things and that can liaise with law enforcement. Um, but, but it is fairly simple. And, and I will tell you as an RIR, we, we ensure that you follow, that you meet policies, right? So you can get an IP address or an autonomous system number if you can meet a community established policy. We don't actually you know, look much further as to how you're going to be utilizing your, your number resources until it comes to them being used illegally. And then we can take a role. So I, I hope that makes sense to you. Most, most definitely. And I really do appreciate that, Leslie, because it's, it's a question that we've had. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, we made the request to speak at the IGF to have these conversations. Uh, ultimately, we want to work with um, and not against. Um, and by having an insight um, into this uh, ecosystem and the processes, um, I believe that we can work a lot closer um, in, um, in making uh, the internet a better place. Um, it, 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 is it possible at all, Leslie, that we could um, we could connect offline? Absolutely, she, she just said that. Uh, I will try and get the contact and share with you. Brilliant. I just wanted to add um, just one additional questions on the role of um, some of those folks who actually host IPTVs, um, which some of them distribute contents which are a little bit illegal. Um, and then you also look at the statute of limitation when it comes to the um, Digital Millennium Act, and you find out that you can get to prosecute some of them, um, given that their operations are within certain regions um, that um, don't have strong copyright act laws um, that can protect you. So even though you try to follow the money, um, the laws that can help you prosecute some of those guys are also not that. And take, for example, most laws, um, most copyright laws now um, do not include internet or rather some of the African laws that I know, copyright laws that I know of, do not have more of um, the use of internet infrastructure as part of their copyright um, stuff. Take for example, I know in the case of Nigeria, um, if you decide to host like an IPTV infrastructure within Nigeria, um, the copyright law act that might help you to prosecute such persons um, are not strong enough to help you prosecute. So maybe you might have a little thing to talk about that, um, Lee. Certainly, and, and, and that, that's one of APA's roles um, in, in the process of gathering information, uh, doing white papers um, in order to lobby governments um, to recognize that intellectual property and copyright legislation needs to be strengthened. Um, APA predominant focused, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, on Europe and the Middle East um, and, and um, have been working very closely with, uh, with the uh, EU government to change legislation um, and to make things better. So uh, in, in, in France and the uh, European Union they are currently looking at a new piece of legislation which will help protect content um, and copyright um, and the creative services um, across the board. That is currently being discussed and the, the kind of finer detail um, is being worked out. And hopefully once it's uh, been enacted, uh, we will have some very good 
legislation that uh, protects um, not just the creative services, but um, people's online presence um, within uh, within Europe and potentially the uh, the, the uh, wider um, countries. So it's a it, hopefully it's a it's a domino effect. Uh, we saw that with the DMCA. The US were the first to bring something in, and that was globally accepted. Uh, so the, the the thinking is that the new EU law that once that's established uh, will have the same, and those conversations will continue um, in all of the territories where um, IP legislation is um, not hasn't matured um, in a way that the internet has matured. Um, so there are no questions from the in-house audience here, on-site audience, right, rather. So um, if there are no questions, um, okay, I see a question come online um, on the role of Weeple in all of this. Yeah, so uh, Sheila Castles is um, uh, the chair of, uh, of APA, um, and she's just reminding me that uh, Weeple uh, also has a role in, um, in, in setting standards and legis legislation. So it's a statement, not a question. Oh, okay, great. So if there are no questions um, from the online audience, um, I guess, Lee, I want to say a little bit of thank you to everyone for coming. I, I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, your points and uh, and, and questions have been very welcomed um, and uh, I feel like we're on a, on, a, on a good road. Thank you. So on that note, we are adjourned. Thank you so much everyone for coming. Yep. Thank you very much, Caleb, for, uh, for uh, um, facilitating. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone, goodbye.